But every once in a while, I talk about interesting investors on this channel. But today, instead of talking about an interesting investor as an individual, I thought I'd talk about an interesting investor as far as a company. And so from the fact that you've clicked on a thumbnail that says Google on it, you've obviously figured out that I'm going to be talking about Google. And also, you're probably watching this on YouTube, which is owned by Google, on your Pixel phone, which is owned by Google, using Android software, which, surprise, surprise, is owned by Google. So it is no secret that they've done very well thus far. And when I started looking into the company, I was more just curious about how the company is going as a whole. But they've invested in some very interesting upstarts and they have some incredible moonshot projects that are currently in the R&D process. But from, from scanning over all of these new ventures, I decided to focus on the five, which I thought would be the most interesting. And I'll also throw in a bonus sixth one that could be potentially very interesting, but there are some ethical implications with it, so Google may not even go ahead of it. But if they do, it could be a very interesting watch space. So I won't waste your time and let's get into the first interesting project that they're working on. Health. So in 2006, Google made the first inroads into the world of health, where they hoped to create a network where patients could send their files to doctors and pharmacists and vice versa, where basically everyone involved in a medical situation could quickly access information. And behind the scenes, Google could then use all of its data and then notice trends for symptoms and even potentially look for early warning signs for many diseases that are out there. But it, this project all became a little bit too hard due to the confidentiality nature of medical records. So this was a bit of a failed attempt, but Google did not give up here. In fact, they're still using the data from our wearables and then putting into mass databases so they can better serve the community via health. So they're hoping to be able to earlier detect heart disease, eye disease, multiple sclerosis and Parkinson's disease to be able to detect it far earlier and then stop it from doing as much damage and then also to better manage the symptoms once someone has been diagnosed with these conditions. They're also tackling cancer as well. As an example, Google applied the artificial intelligence deep mind onto cancer scans and has scanned many people with cancers from historical results from university studies and with the patient's consents. And after they trained its deep mind on how to read cancer scans, they then ran it through in the United States and the United Kingdom where both a normal human doctor do the normal scan but then on top of that they'll just pass it over to the artificial intelligence to read the scan as well and then just process it from there and the results are actually pretty fascinating it reduced false positives by 5.7 percent but this is the thing that was really interesting it actually reduced false negatives by 9.4 percent so just imagine with the millions of cancer scans going on around the world if you can reduce false positives by 9.4 percent that's going to add up to thousands arguably millions of lives saved i mean it's no secret that if you can catch a cancer earlier your odds of survival are far higher than what it would be if you caught the cancer later and now let's just get back to the wearables again so although they can't use official medical records, the data that they can use is from their wearables and they can also use information which users are happy to submit. So imagine that one day your watch vibrates and then it sends a text message to your phone because your body is behaving in a certain way to how other people's bodies were behaving before they had a cancer or multiple sclerosis, Parkinson's or an eye disease. It could apply for your watches, it could apply for your glasses. So this is basically Google's end goal here. Through the mass data, they want to be able to find the early warning signs for some of these really bad diseases and then look for those warning signs amongst the general population. And we've already seen this technology today, not only from Google, but from other fang companies as well, as far as people getting alerts on the watch to say, see a doctor right now, your heart attack is imminent. So imagine that could apply for other things besides heart attacks. That's how Google is venturing into health. But now we'll move on to the next point. This is the venture that I personally find the most interesting, and that is number two, quantum computing. Quantum computing. Quantum computing. Quantum computing. Quantum 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 computing. Quantum quantum quantum. Quantum quantum quantum. Quantum quantum quantum. And when I talk about quantum computing, I'm specifically talking about processing chips. Instead of competing for the current generation or even the next generation of computer chips, Google are thinking generations ahead. And Google's motivation for making this chip isn't just so they can get more market share of a competitive market. Their motivation is that they want to be able to use this chip to create artificial intelligence. It is their belief that the lack of processing power is the biggest roadblock in order for artificial intelligence to reach that singularity level, with the level where it's basically more intelligent than humans. And not only can these chips process more, but they can do it with less power as well. And Google has a couple of very big partners in this project as well. So they've partnered with a Canadian company called D-Wave and they've been working on quantum computer chips for decades and they've also partnered with NASA. Yes, as in those guys that fly into space all the time. And for this chip, it's not only theoretical, they've actually got some working prototypes that are showing some very interesting results. To prove the power of this chip, they decided to use this equation that would take 100,000 normal computers 10,000 years to solve and they decided to run it through its own quantum chip. But when they ran it through the quantum chip, instead of taking 10,000 years, it took three minutes and 20 seconds. 
So that is incredible. But IBM have recently come out and said that it'll take 100,000 computers 10,000 years to process this equation is a little bit exaggerated. They weren't disputing that Google could do it in 3 minutes and 20 seconds, and they're stating that their own computers could actually do it in two and a half days. But still, even if Google's claims that were completely exaggerated, the fact that IBM would take two and a half days to do it, whereas Google could do this in three minutes and 20 seconds, that is still an, an incredible leap and bound for the world of processors. But once the chip is made, it's not just going to be easily mass adopted to everyone. From the ground up, it uses totally different technology, which means it has totally different programming languages. So all the programming languages that are used for existing chips would basically have to be thrown out the window and new programming languages would have to be invented. And so although this chip may be successful, it may not be adopted into everyone's phone and everyone's laptop and everyone's devices. But even so, if that does end up being the case, there's still going to be a massive market for chips that are that much more powerful than anything else going around. I mean, for anyone hoping to crack the artificial intelligence challenge, that's one. The whole banking industry will be very interested in it for the cybersecurity. The whole world of espionage will be interested in it, uh, as well as all mil militaries as well. And also universities that are just trying to crack really complicated things and obviously space exploration as well. And so just off the top of my head, I can just name a few industries that'll be very fascinated in extreme computing power. And I'm not even saying that it won't be mass adopted either. I'm just saying that there's a possibility. And so either way, I think this quantum computing chip, it's gonna have an incredible future. And I'm really much looking forward to watching how this plays out. So now we're transport into the third interesting project. So what is number three? Transport. <laughs> That's right, I made a joke. And while making jokes, can you also transport your finger to the subscribe button? Because, well, you've heard all the reasons before. And so, there's no secret right now that Tesla are absolutely killing it with the whole self-drive technology. And it's very close to being on all of our streets everywhere all over the world. But it's very unlikely that Tesla will be licensing their self-driving software to the 40 competing car manufacturers. I mean, it is a massive advantage that they have, so why would they let their competitors have it? And so, if we're being realistic, the 40 other competing car manufacturers uh, will need to partner with a technology company, as it's highly unlikely that they'll be able to develop the self-driving on their own. And so, out of all of the technology companies, Google is very much leading the way as far as self driving software and they're leading by quite a margin as well. So they own a subsidiary called Waymo and Waymo actually have a working trial in Phoenix, Arizona uh, running as robot taxi services. They still have the human drivers in the vehicles as safety standbys but the idea is that the driver is basically only there to slam on the brakes in case something unexpected happens. And so far this trial is going really well. And so when the self-driving technology passes all its regulatory checks, obviously Tesla's everywhere are going to be doing this. And there are 40 other car companies that probably partner with Google in order to put it into their vehicles as well. So interesting project number four, energy. So Google uses a lot of energy, especially for their data centers. And it is because that there's such a big expense for Google that Google put in a lot of effort as to far as how to actually reduce the amount of power that they use. Not only is this a cost saving measure for Google, but it's also great for the environment. Uh, since 2007, Alphabet Corporation have been carbon neutral. I mean, this is kind of incredible. And Google do own a few energy producing companies. I mean, they own a geothermal provider and they're very big in the wind space as well. But the majority of Google's success though hasn't come from owning these renewable companies. The majority of their success has actually come from using their artificial intelligence to predicting energy peak uses and energy supply peaks, and then marrying all the data together and then working around it. So say for example, if they have a project that isn't time sensitive but it needs to use a lot of power, they know exactly when to use it when the power is the cheapest and when all the solar panels are producing the most power, and they also know to be running as lightly as they can for when the wind isn't blowing and the sun isn't shining. And so they're using that artificial intelligence algorithms to perfectly predict supply and demand and then keep operations in an anticipatory response to how energy supply will go. And in 2016, they reduced their own server costs by 40%. And, and this isn't through batteries or solar panels either. This is just through better managing the power that they have. So imagine if this could be applied for normal households as well. This, is, this will be an incredible technology if they actually release this into the mass market. In 2020, Google purchased a company called Spin Launch. And so what is Spin Launch? They create a structure which is approximately 100 meters by 100 meters. And then they use electrical motors and they spin something up and it goes faster and faster and faster and faster. And eventually they get it up to Mark 8. And when it hits Mark 8, they shoot it upwards. And for this object that they're putting into space, 
but I obviously need rockets just for its last little final adjustment so it can confirm its final orbit and adjust and still need to be rockets but it won't be a fraction of what is needed for current rockets and also there'll be benefits for the space industry as well I mean obviously yes it can't be used for launching humans into space but you could use an existing rocket company to get the humans up there and then deliver all the payloads via the spin launch technology they could deliver the foods the, the lab equipment everything they need I mean this may even be an essential tool for getting us to Mars they'll be doing their first launch attempt in late 2022 which is huh, actually this year so I actually really hope this succeeds. I mean, it is, a, it is very much a long shot, but if it succeeds, I mean, holy cow, this is really going to change the space industry. But I should cut myself off before I start talking about a Star Trek utopia future. Google are currently working with the United States military and analyzing its drained footage. And they run this drained footage through the very advanced artificial intelligence algorithms. It is called Project Maven. And it is conducted by the Algorithmic Warfare Cross-Functional Team. Say that 10 times quickly. Algorithmic warfare cross-functional team. Algorithmic warfare cross-functional team. Algorithmic rhythmic cross... Ah. But Google has had some internal resistance to this idea. So in 2018, 3,100 Google employees signed a letter to Google's management stating that they were not happy that they were doing this. And further to that, 400 of those employees actually quit on the spot. Google's justification for Project Maven was that it's primarily been used for defensive purposes and especially in counter-terrorism and intelligence anal anal uh, analysis. But it was still a very bad public relations day for Google. And this is why they've been very shy in bidding for other military contracts. And this avoiding military contracts Tracks has already had a massive financial effect on Google. So before all of this, Google were the preferred supplier for the US military. And there was recently a $10 billion contract for offer for the Joint Enterprise Defense Initiative. Being the military, they love their acronyms and guess what that spells? Jedi. And so Google actually did not submit an application to go for that $10 billion grant. And so did the US military cancel their actions? No, they just ended up giving the contract to Microsoft. It's not only Google or Microsoft who could potentially be competing for these multi-billion dollar contracts. In fact, Amazon and Microsoft have just been awarded contracts in regards to augmented reality and facial recognition technology. But I'm more bringing this up because Google may think to change this not working with the military stance in the future. So there are billions of dollars on the table. And if Google did ever choose to re-enter this contract field, that'd be very much likely to be a preferred supplier just because the artificial intelligence algorithms are way ahead of anyone else. That concludes the five plus one interesting projects that Google are currently working on. And so I just love what Google have done for the world thus far. I mean, they've removed so many of the world's inefficiencies and as thus have made the world a much better place. And I very much look forward to seeing how some of the future projects play out. Anyway, uh, if you want to see how some of my future videos play out, uh, don't forget to hit that subscribe button.